Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to everyone in the room. Great to see such a good turnout. And, and also welcome to our online audience. Uh, we are live streaming this event. Um, for anyone who wants to join the conversation on Twitter, please use hashtag Impact Bonds and the handle ODI Dev. Uh, thank you very much to the panel for all turning up. No one has quit yet this morning, which is good. <laughs> My name is Belinda Goldsmith. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Thomson Reuters Foundation, where we're the charitable arm of Thomson Reuters, where I run a team, a global team of 40 journalists and about 100 freelancers covering the underreported stories. Stories often overlooked by the mainstream media, media on humanitarian issues, women's rights, property rights, trafficking and slavery, and the human impact of climate change. Major themes running across all of these are, include poverty, inequality, conflict, migration, the treatment of women and children, education, and health. So I was very happy to be asked to moderate this panel today on performance-based financing, as this could play a major role in addressing some of these critical issues. Uh, this panel comes 10 months after the United Nations member states agreed a very ambitious set of global goals over the next 15 years to try to eliminate poverty and address inequality. As we all probably know in this room, 17 goals, 169 targets, at an estimated cost of $3 trillion a year. And one of the questions has been, where is this money going to come from? Where is this funding coming from? And how will governments be persuaded to make sure that they do actually stick to Agenda 2030? Um, so can innovative financing play a role in that? We're here today to discuss uh, this rapidly growing field of development impact bonds. These follow on from social impact bonds, also known as pay for success bonds. And we'll go straight, straight into acronyms, because I'm sure there's going to be lots of them here this morning. SIBs. SIBs uh, are a private public partnership to fund effective social services through performance based contracts, through results. The first one was launched in 2010, and then that related to trying to cut the rate of reoffending from prisoners in Peterborough. And there's now been over 40 SIBs. So what's a development impact bond, or a DIB? Uh, DIBs can be used in developing countries to provide upfront funding for development programs by private investors, who are then remunerated by donors or host country governments and earn a return if that program achieves pre-agreed outcomes. The idea is that DIBs, like other models of performance-based financing, will attract new capital and new investors to the development space and help solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. So there, easy, done, isn't it? Or is it that easy? <clears throat> so far, there's only two operating DIBs. And we have Safina here today who will be talking about one of those DIBs, uh, which is to educate the fund Educate Girls in India. <clears throat> So what are the challenges? Why are there only two so far? SIBs, DIBs, philanthrocapitalism, PFBs. There's a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of hype. But is they, can they actually deliver? With that, I want to introduce <coughs> our panel. I'm going to be asking each of them to talk just for a few minutes about their experience on DIBs. And then we're going to have some questions, open up to the floor for questions, and coffee's being served at 11. <coughs> So, first of all, I have Paddy Carter. Uh, Paddy is a research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute in London. Paddy specialises in aid allocation, domestic revenue mobilisation and development finance. Before entering academia, Paddy spent a decade working as an equities analyst at a London-based stockbroker and was also a journalist. We have Donald Menzies, who is an Innovative Aid Instruments Advisor at the Department for International Development, DFID. He leads DFID's work on payment by results. Previously, he was employed as an economist at DFID and the Scottish Government. I have Safina Hussain here, who is the founder and executive director at Educate Girls, a non-profit that aims at tackling, tackling issues at the root cause of gender inequality in India's education system. Safina established Ed Educate Girls as an NGO in 2007 with a focus on enrolment, retention and learning. Educate Girls has grown into an 8,500 schools programme. 
Sophina received this prestigious 2015 Skoll Award for her work. And Phyllis Costanza, who was appointed CEO of the UBS Optimus Foundation in 2011, with the aim of helping UBS clients fund philanthropic programs that improve children's <coughs> lives. Prior to UBS, she was a senior executive and board member of the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, a UK-based philanthropic organisation linked to the hedge fund TCI. Phyllis also has more than a decade as in experience as a management consultant. So, Paddy, if I can pass over to you. All right, great. Okay, and it's uh, that one, that one. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to address myself to two questions which I think you can ask in this context. The first is, <coughs> when is payment by results a good idea? And the second is, if you're going to do payment by results, why finance it with a development impact bond? So on the first question, there's a whole branch of economics called contract theory that uh, builds complicated <laughs> models to try and ask questions like, when is payment res by results going to be successful? And it's not just about what the results will be, but how much it costs, what's cheaper uh, relative to alternative ways of funding things. And it turns out the answers depend on an all uh, a huge amount of things, such as where the financial rewards crowd out social motivation, how much the results are under the control of the agents, and uh, how complex, how multidimensional the thing you're trying to do is. Uh, far too much to talk about here, so I recommend a paper by uh, the DFID chief economist Stefan Dirk and, and um, Paul Clist. But even more usefully, if you Google a blog called Kirsty Evidence, who is actually a um, Kirsty Newman from DFID, she's written a blog translating that uh, paper into English for people that don't read economics <laughs> jargon. So you, you can see that there. Uh, now, one of the most important points to come up from contract theory uh, is summed up in the title of a very famous paper called uh, The Folly of Rewarding A Whilst Hoping for B. Um, and what this is getting at is that if, you're, if the result that you are paying people to achieve isn't really what you want to uh, happen, then you're going to end up skewing effort and uh, sending people down the wrong path. So I guess I'm not an education specialist, but I guess in the context of education, that's questions like, is getting kids to pass numeracy or literacy exams really what you want from education? Now, I'll, I'll just make one familiar point here, which is that you don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And what we're trying to do is improve on the status quo, uh, not necessarily go all the way to perfection straight away. Uh, so when it comes to value for money, uh, contract theory tells us that the big, one of the big questions is how much compensation you have to pay people for bearing risk. Now, with a dip, a, a donor might be able to say, well, we only pay for success. We don't pay anything when there's a failure. But if how much you have to pay for success is sufficiently high, it might be cheaper to pay a, a small payment every time you do something. It's a bit like deciding whether to buy insurance or just get the plumber out when your boiler breaks down. One isn't necessarily um, uh, cheaper than the other. So moving on to value for money. So if you're going to do um, payment by results, why are dibs better than simply a donor contracting directly with a service provider on a, on a payment by results basis? So. Which is a bit of a quick aside, and this is a, maybe a bit of a sort of small point, that when it comes to this idea of mobilizing additional private finance for development, elsewhere in the development world, everybody's saying, oh, you know, there's only a, there's, we need trillions, and the global aid budget is only 130 billion. So elsewhere, we're talking about uh, ways of getting the private sector to pay for things so the public sector doesn't have to pay for them, relieving the public sector of, of uh, financing obligations, in a sense. Here, I don't think we're really relieving the public sector or a donor of, of uh, financial um, obligations. They kind of they pay for the outcome eventually. The private um, investors are just putting money up front. I think here it's better to understand the phrase mobilizing the private sector to mean getting the private sector to do something that it's good at, which could be understood as bearing risk or managing for results. So to focus on efficiency, payment by results involves risk, and the more compensation is required for bearing risk, the worse the value for money will be. So the idea behind a dib is that an NGO or a small service provider, it can't afford to be spending money up front and then risk not getting paid. So um, they would demand an awful lot of compensation for doing that, so that would make it too expensive, whereas private investors, for who a social impact bond might be just one investment amongst many in a portfolio, will require less compensation for uh, bearing risk, so this could be the cheaper way of doing it. Um, and if there are some socially motivated investors out there that are willing to uh, accept lower returns because they want to do some good in the world, so much the better. Although, if you're too reliant on that, you could maybe 
ask some questions about sustainability or scalability, but uh, okay. But what I find hard to, or what I found hard to understand about Dibs is that still nested within this structure, you have a service provider, and that service provider may or may not be paid by results. And the closer you get in the direction of paying that service provider, come what may, then the closer you get to have having constructed a payment by results system where the people on the ground actually doing things aren't getting paid by results. Or if you move towards paying that service provider purely by results, then you go back to having to um, pay them compensation for bearing risk. So I was trying to figure out why this is going to be, in theory, why would this be cheaper than simply uh, replicating the same contract? I understand Educate Girls, uh, they have, there's an upfront uh, funding, but there's also a sort of a performance-related bonus. You could replicate that contract directly. So I was trying to work out why this way is cheaper, and then I thought, well, maybe I'm missing the trick here. Maybe the answer is that the ministers... In the, do in the donor countries, they want to be able to say, we only pay for success, we don't pay for failure. And contract theory tells us that if you try and do that directly with a, with a service provider, it would be insanely expensive. So development impact bonds may be the cheapest way of doing that. So this is something that maybe the people, the government or the donors want to do. They want to be able to say, we only pay for by results. And this is the cheapest way of doing it. Uh, now, there are other reasons why this may be an efficient way of doing things, and um, that's what I'm going to end on. It could be that this whole structure of having you know, more private sector involvement and private sector intermediaries, it, that it somehow brings expertise and management uh, culture to things, and that's what makes the difference. Because the, the, one of the main ideas for payment by results is that uh, you leave it up to people to figure out how to do things, and um, they are able to experiment and adapt. And it could be that trying to, when a donor tries to do payment by results directly with a service provider, they get caught up in log frames and I don't know what, and those straight jackets that, um, that stop the kind of full spirit of, uh, of payment by results happening. Now, I'm, I'm not qualified to say anything about that, really, so I'll just be, interesting, I'll be interested to hear what my fellow panellists have to say on that, on that point. And uh, that's me done. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Donald. Great. Um, so, Donald Mingus, um, DFID, um, what I'd like you to do is, is sort of hold some of those questions on dibs, uh, some, some thought-provoking questions from, from Paddy on dibs in your mind. And I'm going to step back a little to um, Paddy's first point, which was around thinking about when payment by results uh, can work best and, uh, and under what circumstances. Um, so, I'm going to very briefly kind of uh, talk a little bit about where DFID is uh, just now, and then talk a little bit about theories of change, and then... Um, uh, go on to some observations from, from DFID's kind of uh, portfolio of uh, innovative payment by results programming, which, which hopefully will, uh, will be pertinent to this, this broader discussion about DIBs. Um, so first of all, um, uh, DFID definitions. We have quite a broad definition of what counts as payment by results. So anything where some payment is made only after uh, delivery of pre-agreed outputs or outcomes. Uh, so things reasonably high up the results chain. Um, and what we're committed to is DFID. We set out uh, a payment by results strategy in 2014, which, which really had two key commitments in it. One was to learn what works in what circumstances, and the second was to kind of build, build capability to uh, deliver payment by results well. So very much coming at this, uh, coming at this area from a learning perspective uh, to, to learn kind of uh, in what circumstances uh, impact can be delivered. Um, and that was reiterated in, in HMG's 2015 aid strategy, uh, which came after the last uh, general election, uh, where the government committed to expand payment by results in line with DFID's strategy, so very much, um, very much in terms of, um, of learning. And I quite like, I don't know how big the screens are, but I've got a little graph up there which I've um, shamelessly stolen from uh, a blog by Duncan Green uh, in Oxfam. And I, I really like it as a tool to think about uh, how the donor community kind of responds to a, a shiny new idea. Um, and so at the beginning of that graph, you've got, uh, you've got a trigger. So you've got someone's had a, had a really good idea or, or something's been invented, some innovation. Um, and, and sort of so the story goes, uh, goes from Duncan here. Um, I think he was talking here about our response as a community to microfinance as an innovation. Um, uh, so we go from that we go from that shiny idea to uh, uh, we all get very excited um, and uh, and uh, we have um, uh, hold this new idea up as a new silver bullet which will solve all problems at all times um, and then we start 
trying it and, and, and some early, you know, as with anything new, uh, uh, some early difficulties and some teething problems and maybe some early failures are seized upon by doubters who have been sitting quietly while everyone else got, got overexcited to say, look, I was right, this is absolutely rubbish, this is the worst thing we could possibly be doing. Uh, and then only later do we actually kind of find the niche in which this new idea can really be productive and can really kind of add impact and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and learn kind of under what circumstances what, they, what the conditions are for, for that productive environment. Um, so Duncan Green described the, the, the sort of donor community's work on, on payment by results and kind of uh, attitude to it as um, rather than sort of following this story, we were everywhere on this graph all at the same time. So some people were very, very excited, some people were very, very angry, and some people were kind of quietly getting on with sort of trying to work out um, uh, what works well and what works less well. And, and so one of the things I do at Diffid is to, is to try, try and kind of push us towards, uh, towards this kind of productive kind of area where we've found, uh, found our niche. And, and, and on that note, it might be worth, oh, um, could we sort of skip on? <coughs> Or maybe I could just grab the uh, grab the thing and do um, uh, some unnecessary animation. Um, so just very quickly, I mean, hopefully this will help um, help uh, stimulate debate and, and, and discussion. In that, one thing we found, well, uh, one thing uh, around uh, Diffid's uh, portfolio of kind of innovative payment by results programming. So we have um, um, uh, a, pr a portfolio, particularly in programming, represents maybe five percent of our. Um, our portfolio at the moment of uh, you know really trying kind of new ideas, um, and there are quite a number of different theories of change motivating the use of this instrument. Um, so so first of all here we've got um, some pictures of some pico solar lights and some uh, some grain and night some maize in Nigeria I think, uh, and this is looking at uh, PBR as a pull mechanism. Um, so working with kind of private sector actors. Uh, rather than doing the sort of traditional, perhaps, uh, you know, input subsidy, uh, looking at how we can actually shift equilibria in uh, markets to the benefit of the poor using payment by results um, system. So, so the Pico Solar Light example here is quite a nice one in that um, at the docks in Dar es Salaam, sort of two or three years ago, there was a change in kerosene subsidy. Suddenly, at the docks, these Pico Solar products were cost competitive with uh, kerosene lamps. Um, so the payback period of buying a Pico Solar lamp, um, a decent Pico Solar lamp, was about two or three weeks, which is obviously a very short payback period. And after that, uh, beneficiary is is sort of making money every day, and uh, you know, on uh, cost of kerosene averted. The challenge, the innovation that was required, was well, how to maintain that cost competitiveness in remote rural areas where actually people are really dependent on on kerosene lamps, really don't have an alternative option. Um, and clearly, remote rural areas, uh, you know, characterised by a very dispersed demand, extremely high cost of transport. So it's a kind of supply chain challenge. Um, so we're using a pull mechanism there to reward um, uh, private sector uh, operators who, uh, p per unit of light that they manage to sell to beneficiaries in remote rural areas. So rather than the traditional approach of kind of uh, subsidising inputs, where we know what well, the cheapest thing for the firm then to do is just to, to sell around the dock, you know, which, which uh, it, in an area where people have got access to electricity quite, quite, um, quite easily anyway. So shifting the incentive, using payment by results to shift the incentive to pull, uh, pull the innovation through the supply chain so it reaches the beneficiary um, uh, is a really, really interesting kind of uh, approach, which, uh, which we've got a few programs generating some really nice findings. Another area, uh, governance and management change. So, so if you like, on that pull mechanism, we talk a lot about outcome financing. And here the outcome that we're financing is light in remote rural areas, a unit of light or, or a product. Um, but actually the innovation that we're wanting and the change that we're wanting is a process change. So what we wanted to do is with a, with a short-term kind of temporary outcome finance um, incentive, we're wanting to shift, permanently shift market processes so that kind of demand is established and supply chains are established, we can continue beyond the outcome financing. So it's worth thinking a little bit about um, you know, it's definitely a drive to outcomes, and outcomes are a good thing to aim for, but not necessarily always. We can go to outcomes and then go back to processes. And same here. So this is um, working with governments, looking at governance and management change. So um, uh, we've got a lot of work in health, but also kind of uh, in water. One minute to go. Oh, dear. Right. I'll speed up dramatically. Um, so using PBR as, as innovation prizes, brucellosis, largest... Um, uh, largest innovation prize um, seen in veterinary uh, health for, uh, for animal husbandry, in my understanding, launched, um, I think tomorrow is the formal launch, so very exciting. Uh, so again, to kind of bring forward uh, uh, solvers. Um, but I think the theory of change, 
one of these theories of change, which is, is fits kind of most closely with Dibs, is, is really focusing on delivery of outcome uh, as service providers. So programs like Girls Education Challenge, where we um, have a randomised control trial system to look at the impact of our suppliers on improving literacy and numeracy uh, in, in, in several different countries. Uh, so really, really high quality um, uh, uh, kind of evidence creation of impact and tying that into, into financing. So that's the kind of overlap we're looking at, I think, for um, uh, 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 for the kind of natural natural space for dibs would be my my kind of uh, my kind of suggestion. So so worth kind of thinking about um, thinking that a little bit. I've probably got about ten seconds to go, so uh, um, not a silver bullet. So so kind of selection of observations from from our pay, payment by results portfolio, which I think might be relevant. Uh, not a silver bullet. Uh, not a terrible, um, uh, you know, thing which is going to be bad in all circumstances. But we really, really need to uh, remember everything that we've learned in development so far and keep applying it. Uh, just because it's a kind of payment by results approach doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about all the things we used to worry about. Um, <coughs> one thing we found as at, at the point of rollout, so as kind of expanding the portfolio, when we're right at the innovative uh, sort of piloting stage, everyone involved in the innovative pilots really, really understands the problems and the issues and the kind of challenges and the design. Uh, design and delivery. As we start to roll out, something to really be careful of is is that zeitgeist point around um, um, people getting uh, getting excited about the new instrument and then trying to find uh, uh, you know fit fit the new instrument onto kind of uh, starting with the instrument and then looking for problems which maybe don't fit best. Um, again, thinking really carefully. One way to kind of counter that we found is thinking really carefully about the theory of change of the instrument in the context. So, so again, thinking very, very specifically about, well, how do the um, hypothesized benefits, how can they be carried all the way through design, uh, uh, tendering, and delivery in this circumstance? So being very, very, very sort of specific at tailoring, uh, tailoring the, the instrument and its potential benefits to the, to the circumstance. Um, organizational culture, one thing that we found is that actually, uh, through payment by results, uh, uh, outcome-based contracting, um, which may well be relevant to uh, to Dibs uh, uh, Dibs environment as well as that uh, is the effect that kind of we as donors are potentially having the incentives we're potentially having on on constructing new systems uh, and new management cultures kind of within within our partners and getting the incentives right can mean that we're helping kind of um, uh, helping our partners develop uh, new ways of working which can be uh, brought over to to other circumstances so so and getting the incentives wrong can mean that we're kind of incentivizing the creation of um, uh, you know bespoke system which is quite expensive quite high admin and which then can't be necessarily repurposed so something to be kind of careful for uh, on our side really is thinking very carefully about the influence we have uh, hands-on versus hands-off uh, probably don't have time to talk about this anymore. Um, <laughs> and the same with the impact of measurement. Um, so maybe we can come back to this point during yeah, questions. questions like that. Thanks so much, Donald. Really interesting. Safina, do you want to give some examples of how it's worked for you and where it has been successful and the challenges? Yeah, um, absolutely. And before I do that, I just have one request. Could you flag me when I have two minutes left? <laughs> so if I'm on still on the first slide, at least I'll have two minutes to run through everything. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, you guys are like economists and you're just, your language and everything you say is just... So I'm going to talk very much in, in plain speak. I'm a grounds person, so I will describe things just the way I kind of see them in, in um, a simple language. Um, for me, I started Educate Girls around eight and a half years ago. And uh, basically because of the problem, I grew up myself in a patriarchal society I had gone through what it means to grow up as a girl, um, and and I really wanted to do something. Um, India has one of the highest number of out-of-school girls anywhere in the world. And uh, when I went to the government of Rajasthan, they said, you know, we have 650 districts the country is divided into, 26 are critical gender gap, which means which have the highest number of out-of-school girls. So 26 are these hotspots out of the entire country of over a billion people. Um, and nine of those were in Rajasthan, which is why I work there. Um, to give you a sense, in Rajasthan, actually 68% of the girls are child brides, 15% married below the age of 10. So when you talk about girls' education, these are all the barriers to girls' education. If you're getting married at the age of 10, 12, 14, you're obviously not going to be in school, you're going to have children early, and, and that whole cycle of illiteracy and poverty um, continues. Um, in the last eight years, we've grown from about working in 50 government schools. And we went to the government and said, you give us your worst areas. 
where wherever you're having the hardest time solving this problem, you give us those. And so it's grown from 50 schools uh, to around this July, when um, now that the schools are open, we will be in 12 and a half thousand uh, government schools across 10 districts. Um, main reasons for girls to be out of schools are very mindset issues. A goat is an asset, a girl is a liability. You know, why should I pay for her to go to school and stuff? So it's very much tackling mindset issues at the community level. Um, so around three and a half odd years ago, we came across the girl education challenge that <laughs> Diffid um, had put out. And we, it was for the first time that I saw the words PBR, payment by results. And I was like, mm, interesting, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, it really, I, I sort of talked and I talked to people and we developed this proposal and, and Diffid loved it. And it went from 1700, got shortlisted down to the last 35. So we spent nine months building this whole piece out. And then obviously it was decided that India wasn't one of the countries, but we were already invested in this, in this piece, which then I met Phyllis and got converted into, into the DIB. Um, but the big piece that the reason that we started doing this, and I think it's really important to see the intention behind the creation of this transaction was that if I was going to grow from one to four million children to serving four million children, I wanted to have the same level of impact for that four millionth child that came across my program. And this is one thing in the NGO sector, the minute you scale, do you scale with quality? Do you still you know, deliver the same outcomes for that child that's gonna come into your program three, five, 10 years down the line when you're serving a large number of, of children? And that's the main reason. I wanted to build an organization that had it in its DNA to deliver value for that child uh, in a rural, remote, and tribal area. And the DIB, by tying payment to outcomes, seemed like the mechanism that could help us at least test how do you do that, um, which grant mechanism doesn't necessarily um, do. So very quickly, you've got all the players on, on that slide there. Educate Girls is the service provider. UBS Optimus Foundation is the investor. So I don't have the money, so they give me the money up front to go and actually execute. Uh, SIF is the outcome payer, so they're purchasing the outcomes that we deliver on the ground, and they pay for it only when ID Insight, a third-party evaluator, goes and checks and, and makes sure that those outcomes have been delivered. It's a three-year pilot transaction that started last year. It's a proof of concept, uh, covering around 166 villages, uh, 15,000 children, um, and it's in Rajasthan, it's in, in Bhilwada, which is a very, very rural, uh, a remote, uh, and a tribal area. It's a very, very tough area to work in. Uh, the way the payment outcomes are, is 20% weightage on learning, um, sorry, on enrollment of out-of-school girls. So girls who are child brides, girls who might be sitting at home, girls who are not allowed to come to school, finding them, bringing them, enrolling them into school, and making sure that they survive year on year. That's what the enrollment payment is for. And learning is for children in third, fourth, and fifth grade um, on our numeracy, literacy and numeracy tests. So we actually have, you know, in the world, a quarter of a billion children in school today who are effectively illiterate. Um, and for us, we see success to say the girl should be in school, staying in school, and learning, because obviously without learning, everything else would be worthless. So 80% of the weightage for the payment is on learning. The budget for service delivery is around $270,000 over three years. So that's the basics of the transaction. Um, so it is one of the smallest financial transactions in the world, around a million dollars. But in the t number of beneficiaries, uh, it's, I think, um, one of the larger ones with 15,000 children uh, who would be impacted. Uh, learnings, my god. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Do I have a slide on challenges as well? No. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah, it wouldn't fit on the slide. But um, I, I have to say, this has been like the most painful and yet most pleasurable thing I've done in my life. <laughs> um, it's, it's tough, uh, really tough, but it forces you to think about impact so much more deeply. Um, it's, it's been such a journey. You have to... We've had to think very, very deeply about what is it that enables impact for that child and what are the barriers um, to that impact really taking place for that girl child who's sitting at home. Um, it's given us a very clear direction and alignment. So 
what is success, what I say is what my field staff says, everybody knows what it takes to be successful. Um, so we did a door-to-door -door survey of over 34,000 households across the 140 villages we work in to find every single girl who was out of school. There's a huge depth uh, to, to delivery for that child because we don't want to lose even one child um, and have her sitting at home. Um, so there's a, a very clear alignment across the organization. Um, what we also realized is we had like monitoring and evaluation, but we've never had performance management. And it's been a revelation. So we've also realized like the, the data is giving us clarity to say one field staff delivers like four times as much result as another field person. And why is it? Is it a training issue? Is it, you know, that we set the targets really high for them? Everybody else has 25 girls they have to bring out of school. This person has 125. Did we, did we not? So it actually makes me a lot more accountable to my field staff, and that's been fantastic. We've had to think, did we give them too difficult an area? Do we need to split this? Do we need to retrain them? Uh, what is it that's so difficult for some people versus others? Or maybe some people are just not good at this, so we're going to have to find people who are better at, at delivering the impact. So it's really that performance management culture, that performance management system has been excellent. My field staff now have dashboards. Because they're like, if you want me to deliver to outcomes, you better tell me. I need to have my own data. You can't just... You know, regularly, data comes from field staff, gets aggregated into reports, and then gets given to the funder. My field demands data from me now, because they need to see how they're progressing um, on things. Um, and really, it's every last child we're accountable to. We can't leave anybody out. We just, you know, we keep thinking, uh, what is it that we could do? I did parent counseling for one person. She's still not in school. Do we call a village meeting? Do we have the village head go and speak to her parents? Like you keep escalating as much as you can till you achieve that outcome and that impact. Um, and that's been absolutely fantastic. The money doesn't come attached to inputs or you know outputs. So it also <laughs> means that I can move money and resources around the way I see fit or the way my field needs it. So if I've got 40% of out of school girls in 10 villages, and there are others that don't have so many, I can move my entire teams around to areas which have the greatest need uh, for delivery. And that level of flexibility is great for me as an NGO. And I've never had it before to that level where I could just do what I needed to do with the money versus saying we put in our grant agreement that we would do 10 village meetings and we would do blah, 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 and, and you know, this, mm. this thing. And that's fantastic. And I think we should all, you know, delivering a social impact is such a complex business. It is so complex that, you know, giving field people that level of flexibility is fantastic. And I think it should be delivered that way. So uh, that's one thing that we've really, really, really um, come to enjoy. We had wanted to quarantine the Dib area versus the rest of our program, thinking, oh, my God, it might be like an infectious disease they might catch. <laughs> but actually, everything we do in the Dib, the rest of my program wants. Because in the DIB, we make everything as simple for the field staff as possible because we're trying to reduce their burden on, on whatever is unnecessary. Um, so it's just, it's this constant, everything we're doing in the DIB is bleeding into, into the rest of the organization. Um, so finally, uh, it, is, it is kind of altering the DNA of our organization. Here are the results. So the first year results, we've enrolled 44% of the out of school girls we found last year, which was great. And um, around, we've achieved 23% of the learning target. And I also have to say, the first year is always really tough because we had to hire our teams, train them, and, and do the entire operational layout, you know, and deliver. And this makes me really hopeful that when I do get to those three and a half million children or four million children, that I will have an organization that will be able to deliver to pure value add for that child. Thank you. Thanks very much. Phyllis. UBS Optimus got involved. Why, why were you interested and what's been your experiences of working with a DIB? Well, uh, I'm from Switzerland, which is where UBS and UBS Optimus Foundation is based. And Switzerland seems like the very, a very unlikely birthplace for the first development impact bond. It is a prosperous country. It's the spiritual home of private banking. Uh, and if you asked your Swiss banker about development finance, uh, he's most likely to talk about his ski chalet. So, but it is in Switzerland where I met Safina. 
and we agreed to test the potential of these development impact bonds. I was deeply impressed by her personally uh, and what she was trying to do and accomplishing in India. And I thought that her work would complement our foundation, Optimist Foundation's work on addressing the needs of the most marginalized children and also our access uh, to the resources of UBS. UBS is the largest wealth management firm in the world. So um, I thought, great, this is a match made in heaven. Uh, although it was actually in Saint Moritz, which is just a few miles from heaven. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about dibs. Um, lots of big claims made about them. This is the future of finance. Uh, and, and then there's critics who are concerned that um, rich could be getting richer on the backs of poor people. So whatever your position is on this, it's very clear that traditional financing is under severe pressure. I mean, there is no such thing as the status quo anymore. So we need to develop really innovative ways to bring in new actors, new sources of money, a more results-based performance culture than seems like a very sensible idea. And especially now in light of um, ambitious SDGs, and with these ambitious goals comes a very high price tag. And I've seen the funding gap for SDGs range anywhere between 1.4 trillion to 2.5 trillion. But whichever, whatever the gap is, it's huge, and it's much bigger than the mere billions that are flowing into development right now. So how are we going to bridge this gap, and are dibs the answer to this? Uh, if you look at investors or philanthropists, they have not typically, uh, private investors, haven't funded things like basic health care in very remote rural areas because it's really hard to monetize, it's hard to track. Uh, there's no proven structure in place for this. And if you look at philanthropists, here in the UK, I think about 14% of all philanthropic money goes internationally. And in the US, it's less than 5%. So there's a real need to move resources to the people who need them most. And by testing new mechanisms like the DIB, um, we can demonstrate to investors who are on the cusp of giving internationally um, how private capital can complement existing funding streams and deliver results on the ground and generate results-based financial returns. So in short, we can help get more money to places that need it the most. But the thing with private capital is it's looking for a very different culture, a culture like Safina has instilled at Educate Girls. It's a culture of delivery. It's a culture of performance with then bringing in a results-based financial return that can compensate for the risk, which is high, and did seek to deliver this. So vehicles like the dibs should be bringing in new rigor with, with regards to performance and results, which can be replicated, that's the goal here, um, and allow existing development resources to improve the efficiency and the cost effectiveness. And the focus on transparency in DIBs means that there is nowhere to hide. So organizations on the ground have to deliver. And in implementers like Educate Girls who have a performance-based culture and the systems in place to track this, like Safina spoke about, um, and a proven track record are attracted to a DIB because they, they can earn more money for the risk that they're taking, and investors can earn a return. But DIBs definitely are not the only game in town. And as Donald explained with that beautiful graph, um, I'm going to use the analogy of four-year-olds playing football. If any of you have been to a four-year-old football match, you know that when the ball's here, every kid on the pitch runs there, except the one kid who's picking flowers in the corner. 
<laughs> right? So that's kind of like what dibs are. I'm getting calls at UBS Optimist Foundation. We get a call every single week from either an outcome payer or an organization on the ground or a large funder who's interested in developing a dib. Uh, and we're being extremely cautious because it is definitely not for every organization. It's not for every type of program. And I do think that we have to move cautiously, even though I see a lot of promise in this. So I don't think that it's going to replace traditional funding streams, but it will complement them. And where it's going to work best is where there are clear cost economies, um, for governments mainly, or clear outcome targets that can be measured and can be valued. So Educate Girls is a perfect case in point for a very small marginal investment in supporting schools, the cost, the average cost per child is significantly lower to increase enrollment and improve learning outcomes. I mean, we're looking at learning targets that are now 50% higher than the control group. That's for a tiny amount of money. So this can demonstrate to the government if resources are allocated more effectively, the impact that that can have. But it requires a dramatic shift in thinking. And it's a challenge because it, funding organizations like this is very, very different. Um, so it's going to be a challenge to convince governments and others that this will be beneficial. But with a focus on very clear and measurable outcomes, um, I think dibs can deliver much greater cost efficiencies. Um, and then it reduces the need to perform all of these activities that have a very small marginal benefit. One of my colleagues is right now sitting in a um, program development meeting developing another dib. And when we first started negotiating this several months ago, they wanted to include every single activity in this dib. And we've really had to push them to focus on only those activities which are going to deliver the outcomes that we're measuring and that are being paid for. And it's a very challenging discipline for people to get on because everybody has their favorite thing that they don't want to take out. Um, and, and, and also there's issues around behavior change that are very important that are difficult to measure. So you know we've got to be cognizant of when do we include things like that and when don't we. But I do see this as bringing in new money. Um, we've seen, for, for instance, if you look at large foundations, um, and th there's a ton of money sitting in endowments. There's a lot of money sitting in donor-advised funds, and people don't know what to do with it. So dibs give the potential for an outcome funder to avoid having to pay the between 10 to 25% to set up a whole infrastructure, right? They don't need any program managers. They don't need any finance people. They only need somebody to transfer the money if the third party evaluator demonstrates that there's been outcomes. So all of these foundations that are so focused on performance and outcomes, you know, we've just saved them 25% that can now go to fund programs. So I think there's huge potential to bring new money. Finally, what have we learned? Um, Safina talked about some of it. We've learned so many lessons, and um, seven minutes isn't enough time to explain them. And now I think I probably have 30 seconds left. What we've learned is that transaction costs are too high. We've got to bring them down. And, and we knew this from the beginning. Our goal with this proof of concept was um, to put a lot of money into the transaction cost because we uh, we're trying to develop the field and we want to see how we can standardize some of the contracts, how we can standardize um, some of the data collection, et cetera. Um, and as these become more common, the costs will go down, absolutely. So in order to grow these, we are going to need a lot more people who are equipped to design dibs and SIBs. Uh, we need a lot more frontline implementers who have uh, a culture that is open to moving resources, like Safina has said, and using performance metrics to actually manage performance on a daily basis, not just looking at data every year. 
And then we need large donors uh, who want to invest in this. But the big win here is that it can improve efficiency, creating a much more cost-effective uh, delivery system on the front line. And I think that there's tremendous potential um, for the future of development financing with development impact bonds. So I would say watch this space. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you, Phyllis. OK, great. So picking up some points from what Phyllis said, new money. Are dibs a way to bring new money into the development sphere? Panel? <coughs> Donald? Are dibs a way to bring new money into the development sphere? Uh, so, some, uh, so payment by results uh, person. Uh, but my understanding at the moment is at least that, uh, that the, um, uh, the outcome finances would, would generally be seen as, as um, uh, donors or, 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 or developing country governments. Is that, that's, that's the sort of shared understanding of the field? Or, um, in, in which case the question would be, I guess, um, more a timing of money rather than necessarily the aggregate amount of money. So it would be when uh, donors were, were, were paying for those outcomes rather than necessarily uh, whether there was a bigger pot altogether for outcome financing. Uh, unless, I guess, there's, there's ideas around um, this as a way to get these foundations interested in outcome financing in the longer term. Mm, would it bring new pri private sector players in? Do you think it really would, Phyllis? Uh, yes. Unequivocally, yes, it will bring new private sector funders into this space. And the timing of money is key. I mean. It may be a matter of timing, but I don't want to wait 50 years to solve a problem that needs to be solved now. We need to move money into the sector today. Money that's sitting in donor advised funds, money that are sitting in endowments, money that people are too afraid to give internationally because they're afraid that there's a lack of accountability. So I think it will move money faster, which is critical, and I think it's going to get new people who haven't funded internationally to start to do so, and I've seen that every day in my job. Sophie, did you find there was much private sector involvement when you went out and started looking for funding? <laughs> um, so, you know, we, when the whole different thing happened, we went on a roadshow to try and convince people across multiple cities in India to kind of come on board to help us test this. And I have to say, everybody wanted to be the investor. Um, we had so much interest from people, and our main bottleneck was, you know, who was, because the Indian government obviously needed a, a proof of concept before we can convince them to become an outcome pair. But ideally, like in my, my viewpoint, if anybody who's using taxpayer money becomes an outcome pair, we could unlock a lot of, of even local domestic money, uh, you know, which would be ideal, right? You want Indian money to be solving Indian problems. Um, and so, and, and hopefully, eventually, the Indian government can actually get into that into that role instead of just funding a lot of different things that you don't know whether it has impact, it doesn't have impact, um, to really be in the business of not taking risk with taxpayer money and purchasing outcomes. Hmm. Hattie? Yeah, I think I agree with Donald that the focusing on the aggregate isn't necessarily the point here. I mean, okay, if you get some philanthropists that would have been funding art galleries in New York and now start funding education in India, that's increasing the aggregate. But other than that, I think it's more important, you know, you talk about new people coming into this, it's more about what they bring in terms of culture and efficiency and how things are done differently rather than the total sum of finance available, which is more important, I think. Mm. There's been a lot of buzz around this for a few years, and there's only two dibs now actually in operation. Why? Why is there only two? Donald, any ideas? What's the complication? What's the challenge? Um, I'll pass this question on to uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. a colleague who's in the audience who's... Um, He's working on dibs. Fiona Lawless. Hi, I'm Fiona. I'm from Dibbiz. Um, why, uh, why any two dibs? Well, I can't speak probably for what's happened with all uh, these two dibs and why it's taken so long. My microphone doesn't seem to be working. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think from a program manager point of view, one of those challenges could potentially be about how you operationalize support to a dib. Um, but much will really depend on the type of role that you are playing in the DIB. So, for example, I think Donald mentioned about whether you are to be an outcome phone, a funder. Traditionally, donors may be an outcome funder. That may not be the role in the new model. But if it is, there are challenges in any big organisation, I would imagine, about how you really let go of the direction of that project. So it could be in terms of how you manage 
political risks, how you manage, um, you know, in a taxpayer's environment, how do you reassure your own taxpayers that you're getting good value for money out of this model? I don't think any of these problems are insurmountable, but I think it takes time to work through. I mean, there's a whole range of potential procurement challenges, for example, but that's... I, do, I don't know why it hasn't happened. They're the sort of things that I think you probably would have to explore if you were outcome funding as a programme manager. So with ODI and DFID, are we likely to see DIBs becoming part of their portfolio in the near future, or what's, what's the policy on that? <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're still learning about where DIBS works best for development so, and evaluating where we can operationalise support. So that's probably as far as I could say at the moment. And that fits within our broader kind of payment by results uh, strategy, which is very much around uh, sort of testing and learning what works and what can be effective rather than necessarily saying X percent is going to be this and X percent is going to be that. ODI? I think it's a reasonably safe bet that we're going to be seeing more of this in the future, where, where this um, lovely curve is going to settle, I, I couldn't say. But do you, with, these poly, with, with having the outcome so focused, does this mean people won't take the risks on projects or programmes they don't think are going to be 100% guaranteed? Does it stop risk taking? It's a really interesting question, and it's one we see in. Sorry, I've grabbed the. No, grabbed no, the no, answer. drop in. <laughs> That's okay. Panel members, and actually, Sabina, you probably have some really interesting views on this. But what we've seen in the um, in the kind of portfolio payment by results program, in which which is the same situation, kind of uh, uh, suppliers taking risk <laughs> on different stages in the results chain, uh, or potentially some risk sharing at different stages of the results chain. You have to be really careful. I mean, it, it really depends on what you want from the program. So if you're if you're if you're hoping for innovation. Uh, but then putting a huge amount of uh, financial risk on a, on a small organisation. Um, inevitably, that financial risk is going to uh, impact the ability of that organisation to, to uh, take other forms of risk um, because they just may, maybe don't have the balance sheet to absorb the financial risk to try something that's really new and, and untested and then potentially have a financial impact on that. So uh, it may be that you, you take that approach for, for different reasons. And then if you are specifically looking for... Um, uh, for an innov innovative solution to a problem, uh, you may want to kind of structure your finance and structure the the moments in which at which risk um, are transferred differently, and so have kind of a phase where where um, uh, the supplier really is uh, free to to test what works, um, you know, without 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 uh, immediate sort of financial kind of penalty if something doesn't work, uh, and then a second phase which is around okay. We've identified things which work. Let's run with it. Let's let's drive efficiencies. Um, let's transfer financial risk and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that really needs to be uh, designed in if it's going to going to have space uh, to to happen, rather than something that will be automatically forthcoming. Phyllis, you said UBS is working on a second dib now. When you're looking at risk taking, and you obviously looked at quite a few now, you're getting approached every week. What's your view on that? Dibs are not for early stage um, implementers. I mean, that's that's just the way it's going to shake out. Um, this dibs are really only for organizations that can be scaled. So where there's evidence of impact, um, and where there are clear, measurable, proven outcomes. But I don't think that means that um, there's not going to be a place for people to fund risk taking. Many, many foundations now, private sector money, is, um, has their own strategy. There's organizations out there that are funding only overhead. There's organizations that are funding early stage scale, -off, you know, early stage testing. There's those that are funding scale, et cetera. So dibs are going to be for the scale up stage. Um, and and I, don't see their, um, I don't see them working in the um, early stage. Paddy, when do you think dibs could be useful and effective? Um, what I was going to say about on, on risk, if, if, if that's oh, sure. okay, yeah, yeah. I think the one way of thinking about dibs is that they are about transforming risk. So, we, you know, you were asking whether the service provider might sort of think, well, I, I can't afford to take much risk because my organisation will be destroyed if I, if I don't deliver these results. Well, I don't know how big the performance-based element is for Educate Girls, but actually what this that whole dibs thing does is it takes a, you only pay if you get results structure at the top, and it turns it into something that for the service provider... Actually, the amount of risk that you're facing probably isn't that that high. So, I mean, maybe it it is a way of doing payment by results, but actually freeing the 
service provider from some of the concerns and the worries that would happen if you were uh, exposed to too much risk. So I think that that's maybe the nice trick about the whole point of DIVS is, is, is to transform risk. Did you have any discussion along those lines, Athena? Um, yeah, I think for me, um, the way I see it, like the role of DIBs, uh, particularly in terms of what you're taking risk with or where you are and, and where it's most appropriate. Like, obviously, I don't think human rights, you want to do a DIB. Uh, I, you know, there are like lots of things where you can't like say human rights is an outcome and therefore you're gonna, that's not going to work, right? But for things like waiting for universal access to primary education for a rural girl in Africa to wait till 2070, you need a dip there because there are lots of strategies which are tried and tested, which can go to scale, where you can basically pay for outcomes and not take that risk, right? Because you don't want to wait another 50 years to, to deliver um, something as basic as that. So yes, there, there's that appropriate role for dibs, I think comes in more there versus in arts or in human rights or in, 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 in a lot of other places that would be completely inappropriate. Right, I'm going to start taking questions from the floor now. I've got questions on the live stream here. So perhaps the, the gentleman at the back there. 